Welcome to a very special edition of the MIT Open Documentary Labs public lecture series. Today we have a panel assembled around our upcoming report called Just Joking uh, on deep fakes and satire. My name is Kat Zizek and my pronouns are she, her. For an audio description, I'm a white Gen X woman with brown hair. And today I'm in Toronto, situated on the treaty land and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and traditional territory of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe. This land is part of the territory protected by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant. I'm the artistic director of the co-creation studio at MIT Open Documentary Lab. Hi, and I'm Sam Gregory, the program director of the Global Human Rights Video and Technology Network, WITNESS. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I lead WITNESS's Prepare Don't Panic initiative focused on supporting an inclusive global response to malicious uses of synthetic media, aka deepfakes, and on supporting innovations in trust and authenticity. As part of that, we've led a series of consultations on how to prioritize and act on deep fakes, threats and solutions from an inclusive global perspective that centers already vulnerable communities. We push for discussion and action based on those globally identified needs. Together, Witness and the Open Doc Lab have been working in collaboration on a series called Deep Fakery. And we're here to give a sneak peek on the next stage of that collaboration, a report we are about to launch that digs into the fine lines between satire, art and misinformation in an age of deep fakes. We're going to run this session as a round robin panel with lots of clips and lots of different takes. I will be moderating and Sam's going to sit on the panel <laughs> with the uh, special guests Joshua Glick and DJ T and Anya Catherine. We'll be approaching these questions from multiple sides from human rights, scholarship and history, as well as artistic and creative perspectives. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end of the session, so if you'd like to uh, pose a question to any or all of the panelists, uh, please drop it in the chat or the Q&A box. Today we're focusing on the political, artistic, activist and legal arenas in which deepfakes are beginning to intersect with satire, both benign and malicious. But before we get into that discussion, we want to reiterate what we hope people here know, that the most common malicious use of deepfake technology right now is for digital sexual violence. And we must also point to how malicious gaslighting, which we'll discuss later, is often highly gendered in nature. Kat and I are going to start with a brief framework for the report itself. So deep fakes are new, while satire is thousands of years old. Deep fakes were first identified in 2017, while satire has held a long established place in arguably every cultural tradition around the world. Most of you know this, but just in case, deep fakes are computer synthesized audio or video that make it seem like people have done or said things that they actually never did or said. But maybe Al Gore can explain this better. Mr. Gore, let me start by asking, why are politicians in all of Washington so concerned about deep fakes? Well, what has people in the government really scared is that deep fakes can put words in people's mouths. You know, make people say things like vagina and, and poop. And, and, and then you've got senators going around saying vagina poop, but they didn't, they didn't say vagina poop. But you're saying deep fakes are already out there. Yes, deep fakes are everywhere. I'm serial. So satire is a creative genre that uses comedic devices like irony, parody, exaggeration, and other forms for social criticism. In much of the world, it's not protected by law. The US is one exception where satire is protected under US law. Now, for satire to be satire, many argue it needs to punch up. That is, it needs to attack the powerful rather than punch down on the less powerful. And according to communication scholar Donegal Young, satire relies on the audience's participation, that they are in on the joke with knowledge of references and key contexts in order to achieve its intended effect. For our report, just joking, we have looked over at over 70 recent examples of deepfakery. Some are satirical, some not. 
Um, but we use them to probe precisely these lines, the gaps, the intersections that exist between the artistic and civic possibilities of this technology. We argue that a wide range of voices need to be part of answering these important questions that arise in these cracks and overlaps, including not just the technologists, lawyers, politicians, the platforms where these videos are shared and the platforms where they are made, but also human rights activists, artists, journalists, people from all parts of the globe and on the ground. These are the people who are both finding new uses for these technologies, as well as having profound understandings of impact and harm that vulnerable people can face when malicious actors and institutions are not held accountable. And that leads us to our panelists. Um, first up is Josh Click. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, Josh is an assistant professor of English Film and Media Studies at Hendricks College and a fellow at the Open Documentary Lab. And he is uh, a co-author of the report. Hi, Joshua. Um, tell us about your relationship to deep fakes. Hi. Uh, well, thanks so much um, for bringing me onto the panel today. Um, I mean, I, Kat, as you mentioned, I was a, a co-author on the report and I'm a media historian. I sort of come at this both from the perspective of history as well as trying to historicize the contemporary and look at um, present day phenomenon. And there's just, just a couple of things that I wanted to sort of highlight in the report, uh, kind of the angle that we were collectively taking that I think speaks to some of its strengths and things for folks to look out for. I mean, one is this connection across many different kinds of case studies and case studies that some people might be familiar with, others that might be quite unfamiliar, but trying to sort of synthesize a, a wide breadth of examples and make those connections. Two is to open some dialogues and open up a, a kind of space for conversation between the present and past and these connections really across, across history, across time. Um, additionally, uh, to really to see sort of satire as a crucial occasion, both for looking at cases of say, malicious media and, and you know, malicious forms of synthetic media, but also for the kind of civic possibilities um, of uh, synthetic media in a variety of forms. Um, and that takes us to you know, some of those many disparate kinds of examples included in this report. Thanks, Josh. We're also invited, uh, we've also invited special guests, DJ T and Anya Catherine, who are Los Angeles-based experimental artists, but today they're coming to us from, uh, from Denmark. And uh, they've been named as, by Clot Magazine as two critical contemporary voices on digital arts international stages. Clot Magazine says they are an LGBT power couple. And they're also in the middle of a production um, with uh, Deep Fakes, an art project called Soft Evidence. Welcome and tell us about Soft Evidence. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for having us and I'll just share my screen. My name is Deja Tai and I'm Anya Catherine and both of our pronouns are she, her. Mm -hmm. uh, our practice uh, emerges creative technology, performance art and large scale environments. And we're going to bring you through soft evidence which was supported by Media Futures receiving funding from the European Union's uh, Framework Horizon 2020 program. And our particular focus uh, within the mis and disinformation uh, aspects for, for this program was around AV manipulation. And so soft evidence uh, we describe as a slow synthetic cinema series de depicting events that never happened. And we do this via nine scenes and one testimony. And so you can see here the nine scenes and then, That's a, not me. And then a testimony. Um, and if you wanna talk a little bit about the slow cinema yeah, and I, I think when thinking because deep fakes are not one thing, they have so many possibilities and ways that they could come across and be created. So we we're thinking about what to kind of merge synthetic media with um, that would be make conceptual sense. And we're huge fans of slow cinema. So slow cinema is very, it's characterized by uh, a kind of minimalism, very long takes. It's also called contemplative cinema. And I think kind of going back to Sam and prepare, don't panic. We're entering, I think, a phase where we need to not knee-jerk react to media. We need to learn to kind of slow down our consumption, to see something and respond to it or look into why it ended up in front of us, who made it, and all of these things, which is why we took the slow cinema kind of medium to make our deep fakes. And you've already done, uh, both Kat and Josh and Sam, a lot of the legwork, because usually when we give this presentation, we talk for the first 30 minutes about the sort of landscape. Um, so since you've already done this, Thank we you. can move right into this. Um, but I, will like to, I would like to say that soft evidence addresses uh, 
deep fakes and synthetic media in a two-pronged approach. Uh, one is from the angle of they're guilty, look what they did, and just depicting someone doing something they've never done or saying something they've never said. But then the second prong is I'm innocent, that's a fake uh, that's a fake video. And this really ties into the liar's dividend and uh, plausible deniability. Um, so really our, our protagonist plays both sides within soft evidence. So as we go through this, we're gonna show you some of the imagery. Um, and when we talk about the aesthetic strategy, it was very important for us to have this be apolitical in content uh, for a neutral ground for conversation. This was a key aspect of our approach. As you see here, the scenes we had thought about whether we wanted we kind of were thinking about people who are completely opposite sides of a political system um, in terms of their preferences, being able to stand in front of something, look at something and talk about the fact that they're not sure whether it's real or fake, rather than be distracted by whether they like or agree with the message of that person. So we took this kind of, like Deja said, apolitical and content, although as we know, the implications of the technology's existence um, is really political. And just to highlight one of them, as Sam mentioned, the digital sexual violence through deep fakes, we wanted to kind of take the tool that's used um, in such a horrific way against women and use it and create a deep fake that is actually depicting a moment of queer consensual intimacy, something aspirational and beautiful to kind of undo uh, the way it's normally used to depict women and sexuality. So if we look at our synthetic art process, uh, we'll dive into that a little bit. So when you're going to create a deep fake, um, especially a very convincing one with no trace of manipulation, you need a lot of data. And so in this case, and especially after conversations with Dr. Kate Crawford, we were discussing the implications and dilemmas of AI and art. And when we got to the, the bit about how are we going to create a data set or um, leverage an existing one, we really ended up deciding not to use an open data set uh, because they're not inherently you know, free of problematic issues. And it's really hard for us to say, how were these images procured and were they done ethically uh, and with consent? Um, so because of that, we decided to not scrape the internet, not use an op open data set, but instead um, over five days, we did a data capture. Um, this was a five day shoot in Mexico City. So you can see here some of the behind the scenes um, footage. And for us, um, this aspect really demonstrated how much effort it goes into uh, to create a consensual data set and how much time and money and legal effort as well. And this doesn't necessarily uh, pose as a full blown solution, but really just demonstrating um, this, this kind of um, maximum effort. So we, we really even went to within the uh, appearance release going to the extent of making sure that we could uh, define what it was that synthetic media is and how that we would be using artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning processes to uh, develop essentially a face swap. We loved our contract so much uh, that we use it as a prop in one of- Yeah, that's so the, actually the contract yeah. as a prop in the scene. And this, actually this scene is called Liar's Dividend. Um, so let's go uh, slightly more into the process. Um, Anya was the body double, and we also had a data body or the data subjects, we could call her, uh, who is on the bottom. Anya is on the top. And we went forward by capturing the data um, in a 15 minute long clip uh, with our source subject and also in lighting specific uh, facial capture environments. Uh, you can see here uh, Karina on the right, who is our data subject, and Anya in the left. After that, we shoot destination, destination footage. Uh, the destination footage is where we target uh, the, the face onto the destination to do the face swap. And then lastly, we use machine learning, um, which is um, our approach was using a deep fake algorithm that uses convolutional neural networks uh, in order to achieve its results. And you can see here one of the deep fakes. Mm -hmm. 
you know, talk about and in terms of how the world interacts with soft evidence and counters soft evidence, we decided to do both a digital version and are choosing Telegram as an experiential vehicle for the work to be experienced for audiences, no matter where they are. And we specifically chose Telegram because of how deep fakes, how deep fakes are circulated oftentimes in closed messaging groups. Um, so it's kind of unfolding over Telegram. And then we're also going to be doing a physical installation, which is a bit more experiential, kind of two parts, one part very visceral, emotional, productive, confusion, and then um, you kind of exit with a replacing the exit through the gift shop with the idea of exit through the classroom where you get into this kind of confusing um, visceral moment and then you leave and you're kind of armed with tools and information on what to do and how to navigate this landscape. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah, so the final vehicle for this work and within an experiment experiential medium is really to figure out how can we use feeling states to help us learn through collectively navigating uh, a changing media landscape. So um, yeah, that is it. I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was wonderful to see behind the scenes of your ongoing work. Um, but it's now our turn to ask you how you feel, what feeling states you uh, enter into when you see the footage that we're about to, to share with you. Um, so we're gonna go into the round robin portion of this panel. And um, we're gonna start with a pretty a montage of classical um, deep fake. Tell us what you, what you feel and see when you watch this. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful to Channel 4 for giving me the opportunity to say whatever I like without anyone putting words in my mouth. Deep in our hearts, we decided to believe that climate change will occur in a distant and horrible future. Lots going on there, Joshua. This is um, is this as a media media historian? Is this satire as we know it, or is this something different? What do you see? Yeah, I mean, very quickly, I mean, I think it's definitely you know, new in terms of a lot of the tools and, and the technology sort of in play. Um, I mean, I think it is satirical in the way that hyperbole is working, these sort of grotesque performances calling attention to, you know, misguided leadership, uh, atrocities, you know, um, uh, acts of mismanagement. And I mean, just very quickly, the historical angle, I mean, this is combining, a, you know, a kind of deep fake at work in this, um, for, the, for the aim of satire, but is I think very much in dialogue with the kind of history of these sort of sort of low comedic arts of um, you know glitch aesthetics and the way the camera is moving. I mean, it's ways that is essentially revealing its own fabrication while still able to advance a kind of critique. I think quite productively. Sam. Yeah, I, I love most of these clips because they, to me, are like using deep fakes in a really classical satirical and product tradition. Right, you're punching up. Um, you're using context people know really well. So Bruno Sartori uses these real soap opera contextual references in Brazil. If you live in the UK, you know the Queen's Christmas message. So there's like a real context to all of these of people in power. So I love the sort of self-referentiality and how people are using deep fakes here um, to, to poke fun and to criticize the powerful. So for me, these fall very much in a kind of classic satirical tradition, of course, as well as the Russian and Chinese examples. Putin in a jump, uh, gym suit. Uh, can you comment on the choreography? I understand one of you is a choreographer, Anya and DJ. Yeah, um, 
I think that he could have used his head a little more to like really make the <laughs> movement full. So it didn't just stop at the neck. Like when he put his hands up, maybe he should have gone like two, <laughs> you know, just to like really complete the look. Um, but I, I do also love the punching, the punching up. And I also imagine that it might feel like you're, you're able to get a point against such an impossibly power powerful person in this silly way. And there's not very many ways that the everyday person can kind of take a job, I think, at someone that's so powerful and untouchable and might be um, making your everyday life very difficult. So I can imagine that there's a feeling of success and happiness in that in that moment. Okay, where's that line between satire and disinformation? Uh, this is something we found on the Babylon B website, um, which is a flow chart uh, that helps, uh, I guess, uh, its intended audiences to navigate satire or dangerous disinformation. Sam, can you tell us a little bit about the Babylon B and you know what this flow chart is or isn't doing? Yeah, the the Babylon B is one of um, a site that Josh and Henry, the two co-authors of the report, highlighted in the report. And it's interesting, it's a Christian news satire site. Um, and it's also been at the center of being uh, called by both mainstream media and by fact checkers on platforms, misinformation. And I think this is, it pulls together a lot of the issues you see in this flowchart around grappling with satire in a contemporary context, right? Which is, you know, um, who's policing it, right? Platforms and the media. Um, but also questions of like, it's not quite so simple of, does it make fun of something? Do I disagree with it? Um, was it fact checked, right? Like one of the criticisms of the Babylon Bee is that it punches down, right? That it's misogynistic, that it targets LGBTQIA plus um, populations with its humor. Um, and that it also deliberately is part of reinforcing already deceptive information and putting that out into the world. And so I think when we look at satirical media, we have to think what is it in doing in relation to a bigger media ecosystem? Um, and I think, you know, when we look to this just joking report, we're really trying to say what happens when, um, when not everyone's in on the joke, what happens to the punch when it punches down and how does this all relate to this bigger media ecosystem where we're starting to place deep fakes into this space. And so this flow chart, although it's actually quite funny to look at because often we have these biases as we deal with information, also starts to point at the complexities of this and the different players in it. DJ and Anya? I have nothing to add. That was perfect. <laughs> Joshua, do you have? Yeah, I mean, I, and I encourage everybody, you know, to check out um, this case study and Babylon B is, is a really fascinating example. I mean, it does position itself, it sort of announces itself as, as a, a kind of right wing version of, of, of the onion. But as Sam was saying, I mean, it doesn't in this chart and, you know, how the bee, you know, continues to function doesn't really account for the fact that it does not only punch down, but also the way in which the articles that it generates circulate online. Um, I mean, so many of them are, are believed as, as being true, um, including, you know, the president retweeting um, articles and things like that. Um, and so, you know, that fact um, really has everything to do with the kind of thread of, of a lot of this kind of media circulating in our contemporary um, ecosystem. Well, and that leads us to the next clip. Um, beautifully, Josh, uh, what about when something is put out there as truth? Um, in this case, we're gonna show you a clip uh, that was tweeted by a White House Deputy Chief of Staff on August 20th. And uh, this is a, a Washington Post breakdown of the clip and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. Wake up. Yes, wake up, wake up. Okay, <laughs> this is your wake up call. Nothing. Okay, um, I'll tell you what, we are going, he's, yeah, he's meditating, he's having, he's taking a little nap. Yeah, Harry Belvani joining us live this morning from New York. Hey, good morning, Harry. Harry. So that starts uh, showing you how how the clip was formed. This is this was three months before the election in 2020 in the states. And it took 12 days for the White House Communications Director, Tim Murtaugh, to reply um, on Twitter again. This was a retweet of somebody else's um, video, and it was quite obviously a parody. Um, so what happens here? What happens here, Josh? What's, what's going on? 
I mean, a, a couple of things. I mean, one, I mean, it's a, a video that I think is revealing of just how easy it is to, to manipulate this kind of media. I mean, not just in the realm of, of deep bakery, but, you know, the kind of cheap fakes and shallow fakes um, that we do talk a little bit about in the report, but the kind of cutting and pasting and reorganizing of material to create, um, you know, a video like this. I mean, I should also say that, um, you know, part of how these kinds of videos, you know, gain steam and gain power and momentum is just through, you know, the amount of time that they can hang out in the in a media ecosystem, the ability to be retweeted and sort of talked about um, and can be quite dangerous. You know, obviously what we see right here is sort of building into this idea of, you know, the persona of, of Biden as a candidate, um, you know, something that was sort of used as a kind of punching bag on, on the right. And that kind of persona sort of crystallizes by way of, um, you know, films like this. DJ Anya. Yeah, I mean, I would just support uh, what Josh is saying. And also, I think this is where the context uh, becomes really, really important. Uh, the fact that this is within a or outside of its original context um, is is something that I think is is problematic. Um, and again, as Josh just said, the timing, um, 12 days, it might as well have not been corrected. Um, I mean, it should have been corrected, but sooner uh, and immediately. But I think the moment something like this is released, um, the damage has already been done because also you have the issue of people wanting to believe um, what they see. And so if they're, it's already pre-aligning with um, their existing beliefs um, or prejudices, then of course, um, you know, this just supports that. One of the things that we talk about in the report is gaslighting. Sam, can you talk a bit about this as a case of gaslighting? Yeah, I think very clearly this is a case of gaslighting. So gaslighting is when you um, do something malicious and then when someone um, responds and, and says, why did you do this? You claim you were just joking or you claim that the, the victim has misinterpreted the intention or the impact of it. And, and to me, this is very clearly gaslighting for, for a number of reasons. And the most obvious is that they, they were in no hurry to correct the impression. Uh, 12 days is a lifetime in, um, in, in social media. And so uh, that deliberate delay, that deliberate, oh, you didn't get the joke when in fact they released it in a way that was intended to be malicious. And, and I think, you know, this is where we see these intersections with deep fakes where things look, you know, we can do this with a cheap fake, you know, a piece of editing, but with a deep fake, you can make it look very realistic. And the impression left with people, you, if you correct that 12 days later is very different um, and unlikely to leave much impression. And so they're relying on gaslighting here and they're relying on context collapse. You know, the idea that you could just strip things of their context and then, um, um, people will believe something that uh, isn't true. And 12 days is a long time, but it only took me a few minutes to create um, uh, this next clip uh, using one of the ubiquitous apps available out there to anyone now. This one's called Wombo, and I, I didn't get them to sign the contract, but I did get permission from all panelists to create this. Never Creepy or fun, Sam? What do you what do you feel? I'm I'm with fun on this one. Absolutely with fun. Uh, because I gave my consent and because it's in this context. Yeah, and uh, Wombo certainly um, foregrounds that they're making this stuff look silly too, that they're not cleaning it up. Uh, Josh, have you ever seen yourself be fake before? Is this, is this a first for you? You know, I haven't, and I was a bit nervous, um, but I mean, yeah, I, you know, I dig it. I mean, it's playful, you know, this sort of bending of the, you know, the face and everything, I think it is just sort of part of um, the kind of aesthetic that I think is, you know, sort of wild and playful and fun um, and within a very sort of old genre, I suppose, of, you know, people sort of, um, you know, participating in these kind of music video fabrications. So I think, yeah, it's fun. And, and, and I like the fact that it involved, you know, all of us together, an ensemble. Anya and Deja, is this something to prepare for or panic? I know there's a lot of panic around these apps out there. I think this instance of it, I love and I think is really fun. Also, I think it's interesting that you put yourself in the same scenario that we were all in as well. 
which is, I think, maybe a true test. Would you want someone, if you're going to make a deep fake, would you want that same exact one made of you? Might be a nice test. So yeah, the, the consent, the obvious playfulness, not trying to make anyone think it's real, and also that you are happy to be in the same position, I think is a good, good use. Yeah, and per perhaps you know when you when you get to play around with with an app like this, it's that media literacy of learning, you know, as Josh was saying, the the tools and and um, understanding how these images are constructed or deconstructed for sure. Um, but okay, let's 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 move into another area. What about uh, resurrecting the dead? Um, this is uh, a, a a thing that's happened in the last year or so. I think there was a cohort of of activist projects uh, in which they um, they resurrected uh, dead activists. Uh, in this case, um, in Mexico, the group Propuesta Civica brought back the murdered Mexican journalist Javier Valdez Cardenas to call for an end to the horrific state-backed violence against the press. Even though the filmmakers obtained the consent from the victim's families, the dramatic presentation of the deceased delivering political charged messages proved controversial. Let's take a look at this one. Señor Presidente Andrés Manuel López Obrador, soy Javier Valdés, periodista y escritor. El 15 de mayo de 2017, fui asesinado por órdenes de alguien a quien no le gustó lo que publiqué, pero aquí estoy, como me ve, hablándole. Hoy una pandemia afecta al mundo. Pese a ello, tenemos que seguir hablando de otras dolencias que en México han cobrado aún más vidas. Yo no tengo miedo, señor presidente, porque no me pueden matar dos veces. Por eso vengo a hablar por las y los cientos de periodistas que fueron asesinados, desaparecidos y desplazados por realizar un periodismo ético de investigación que desnudaron las entrañas del poder corrupto y el crimen organizado en México, que es producto de la indiferencia, por no decir complicidad de varios gobernadores y funcionarios estatales y federales. No vengo aquí a pedirle un favor, señor presidente. Vengo a exigir. Do, do the, um, the ends justify the means here, Sam? Yeah, it, this is, it's, it's such an interesting case because I'm incredibly sympathetic to the usage here, um, you know, knowing um, the campaign groups and the individuals who are involved here, we're really trying to think, how do we call attention to this? this huge scaled problem of the killings of journalists and other civilians in Mexico. And the other ones in this space have included the Parkland shooting and someone doing a, you know, an appeal against suicide amongst police officers. So I think the, the challenge to wrestle with is kind of like, this is sort of the, the easy end of the pyramid, right? Like these are the ones where it feels very easy because, you know, it's for a political purpose. There's consent of the family. Often these were public figures already. And it's as we go further down that sort of all of the rest of the manipulations and the ability to put words in people's mouths, how do we start to feel about that? Um, because these almost feel easy to, to do it at this at this point. Um, you know, and so I think that's that's the real grappling that happens as we move away from these very high profile ones like this. I do also want to raise a point that um, uh, a panelist in a session we did when we talked about this reporter a week ago raised, uh, Mutalian Conde, a leading expert on AI, really also wanted to place this in a cross-cultural context and kind of really thinking about this, this idea of resurrection, appropriating someone else's image and how we make sure as we look at this, we address it in a range of cultural traditions. Um, and she was talking about African, indigenous cultural traditions and how do we think about this? And I think often the leading edge of these usages happens in uh, US and Western political context, and those often have very little attention being paid to, uh, you know, how this usage might play out in different cultural and political traditions. And so I think it's really important, even as we might valorize something like this to say, where would we draw the boundaries on individuals, but where might cultures and political systems say, you know, this is, you know, inimical to how we think about uh, the nature of someone's image and the, the continuance of it. Anya and Dija. Uh, you you expressly went apolitical in in uh, soft evidence. Here are, here are these explicit political attempts. For sure, and, and I, I and even still, I would say here there's a lack of labeling. 
um, that I would like to see um, applied to something like this. So, um, you know, I think the points that Sam made and also last week, uh, the contributions that were given about this, I think are really, really valid. And I would go further to say uh, something like this should be labeled if we were able to get past um, those first sort of check marks. Uh, I also feel that um, consent of the family isn't consent of, of the person. So unless that was already laid out in a will or, or somehow, uh, I'm not sure how you would go about that, but mm -hmm. I think consent of, of the person is, is very important. Does your contract include a posthumous clause? It does not, so therefore- um, No. It, it actually only allows for the scenes that we created uh, within the work. So no other works will be created outside of that. Got it. Um, Josh, we're gonna move to another clip and I'm gonna ask you to comment on that one. Um, this, in this case, family was, their, their consent was not gained um, uh, and uh, it was not labeled and it was disclosed in a rather back, uh, backwards kind of way in an interview after the documentary had been released. Um, and uh, it's, it, you know, it was, a, it was in the hands of a professional. In this case, Morgan Neville. Um, many of you may know this case. It exploded in the summer, uh, where Morgan Neville used AI to reconstruct Anthony Bourdain saying out loud emails he had written, but never actually spoken. Um, so let's. I found a clip of it. Let's let's take a listen and uh, and uh, hear your comments. You were successful, and I am successful, and I'm wondering, are you happy? successful and I am successful and I'm wondering are you happy Josh um did did uh, did the documentary community go too hard on Morgan Neville here or is this just a creative tool that we need to explore what, what's what's going on for you yeah I, I mean there's certainly I mean that you know I, I'd say a number of issues sort of came out in the conversations and the interviews you know in the context of this film I mean you know there's certainly this issue of craft and documentary which you know craft and ways films are shaped and you know in, in various ways across many different kinds of documentaries and I mean that's that's always you know, the case I think with this example, I mean, there's the issue of disclosure, right, that people didn't necessarily know or were not aware that, that this was happening. There was a, a kind of impression of maybe his voice from reading it when in fact, you know, that didn't happen. And then, I mean, I think another thing that, that sort of came out is, you know, when sort of confronted with this, Neville, you know, said that there could be, you know, a, a documentary ethics panel, you know, about it at some point down the line, which seemed to kind of, you know, package or you know relegate these kinds of discussions, these kind of you know reflective conversations to some sort of later point rather than these questions, these issues really being at you know at the heart of you know talking about these kinds of creative and ethical decisions. So I think both of those um, issues were, were uh, quite crucial. Sam, you were you were in, in quoted a lot in in the media on on this um, on this video on this documentary. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, there were core principles here, which which Josh outlined around consent and disclosure and labeling that that are central to how we think about this. One thing I'll point to is I think there's a lot of discussion happening now in a lot of the creative communities and commercial communities around deepfakes, around how we think about this, you know, and so what are the, you know, an app like Wombo or a documentary film like uh, the film about Anthony Bourdain, you know, what is an appropriate way to signal that something has been manipulated? What is an appropriate way to do that that is genre specific? What is a way to do that that's durable across, you know, this context collapse and all these things? And those are challenging questions, and they're not going to work like Wombo is very different from an Anthony Bourdain film. Um, I do love the example, and we featured it in our Deep Fakery series last year, Kat, from Welcome to Chechnya, where David France used, uh, and his team used that sort of light shimmer around the head when they used a deep fake to anonymize someone with an activist face. Um, you know, that was a really powerful example of using a creative way to signal it that didn't interfere with the artistic experience of the documentary. So I think there's actually a, a real opportunity for creativity here by documentary makers and artists, not a barrier. And then there's going to be a much more utilitarian way to deal with this in apps and other spaces where it's going to have to be much more scaled and um, much more, you know, um, you know, computer generated like watermarks and labeling. Is labeling something you've given a lot of creative thought to on your DJ? In terms of soft evidence, definitely, I think people would enter knowing it's a synthetic 
it's slow synthetic cinema. So they're entering with the idea that there is manipulation in what they're about to see. But on the Anthony Bourdain question, I feel like in terms of context collapse, it's not just political context collapse or even platform context collapse. But for me, this example is kind of an artistic context collapse because as someone who creates, like if you wrote something down, there's a reason why that is something that you wrote down and that you didn't say in an interview. Um, and people expressed very different things in very different mediums. So the fact that this was a private email and it's not something that he said in an interview or said out loud shows kind of a lack of understanding of um, privacy and also just because he wrote it, um, it he, what, he didn't say it for a reason. And so I think that's kind of like the artistic context is super important here. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great nuance there. We're going to move uh, to Liar's Dividend and Labeling. Um, and this is certainly something that you're, you're, it's dead center in what you're doing, <laughs> Anya and Vija. Um, but we're going to do it in a unique way. We're going to take three, um, three clips from around the world. We're going to show them in sequence. And then we're going to have uh, all of you responding in whatever you, way you'd like, whether you want to just focus on one of them or uh, compare any or all of them. So um, Liar's Dividend, uh, you beautifully uh, explained that on Yandija, but um, in uh, Gabon and um, Myanmar, uh, this was certainly an issue. Uh, the first clip is um, in 2019, a poorly made video of a New Year's address by the allegedly incapacitated Gabonese president, Ali Bongo, was declared a deep fake and part of a cover-up by opposition leader, Bruno Ben Mumbamba. Although the video was not in fact a deep fake, it contributed to growing civil unrest and an attempted military takeover. So let's take a look at this one. Mes chers compatriotes, Gabonais, Gabonais, avant toute chose, permettez-moi de vous adresser. It was his first public statement since falling ill, and he looked different. A neurologist told the Post his appearance appeared consistent with someone who had a stroke or a brain injury and even cosmetic procedures. He has a great deal of facial makeup and I think he probably had Botox um, because neither side of his face is moving. You don't see the wrinkles in his forehead and, the, and in most of the rest of the face. If you look at his eye, the distance between the upper lid and the lower lid is greater on the right than the left and that's an indication of facial weakness. And finally, that right hand is quite puffy and quite consistent with non-use due to weakness or paralysis. But many Gabonese, especially critics of the president, were not convinced that the president's strange appearance was health-related. Beaucoup ont pensé qu'Ali Bongo était mort. Beaucoup sont même convaincus. Beaucoup de Gabonais sont convaincus que la personne qu'on voit à la présidence qui fait some thought it was a deep fake or a video manipulated with artificial intelligence. They tweeted their theories, and a Gabonese publication reported the deep fake suspicions. So there's one case um, with uh, very vulnerable sitting duck of, uh, of an ill president, which we see play out over and over again, uh, currently in the Czech Republic. I know that we're, we're going through that right now. Um, with with big consequence. Uh, the number two clip here is in Myanmar, which uh, Sam and um, Henry Adger were heavily involved in real time analysis of this one. Um, it was after the in the aftermath of the 2021 coup uh, d'état in Myanmar. There are widespread claims to deep fakery concerning the video confession of the former chief minister Phyo Min Tien. He alleged corruption, he alleged corrupt charges against the ousted Burmese leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, and uh, AI experts uh, deduced that the video was most likely a coerced confession rather than a deep fake. And uh, Sam, Sam certainly was one of those who, who uh, was dealing with this clip in real time. Very low quality clip, and this is certainly how it was experienced online. Um, and number three, meanwhile, uh, this overstepping issue with labeling. Um, can it have a stifling impact on creative expression? 
free speech and open debate. In this case, in Cameroon, a local academic and activist shared a clearly fabricated video of the French ambassador telling Cameroonians that they never achieved independence from France's colonial exploitation. Facebook's third party fact checkers at the French broadcaster France 24 labeled the video partially false, thus nullifying the rhetorical power of the critique. Voilà. Je suis le proconsul de France au Cameroun, pardon, l'ambassadeur de France au Cameroun, Christophe Guillou. Je voudrais dire quelques mots aux Camerounaises au Cameroun. So let's go to you, Sam. What, uh, what do you see with these three clips? So, um, you know, th this is the problem that we've been seeing. One of the problems we've been seeing most broadly globally is that it's incredibly easy to dismiss something as a deep fake. It takes a few words um, and it increasingly hard to detect deep fakes. Um, that's obviously not the case with the Cameroonian ambassador, I want to be clear, like uh, the French ambassador, that's very clearly a, a Wombo-like deep fake. But the Myanmar one was really interesting. We were grappling with it in real time because journalists in Myanmar reached out um, to me as it started to circulate. And what we saw was this video, which was very, you know, um, hard to, to analyze really because it was low quality. He did look like he was speaking out of sync. His voice sounded stressed. And, and, and people in Myanmar, including journalists, had placed it in an online detector that came back saying 95% likely a deep fake. And so you have this intersection of two problems happening here. One is people really don't know how many deep fakes are out there and kind of worry that people could be trying to fool them, right? So there's an assumption that we're surrounded by deep fakes that has been one of the things we've pushed back on in witness with this prepare, don't panic uh, type approach. And the second was there was no easy way to then see if it was or wasn't a deep fake, right? So you have this combination of the rhetorical panic plus the inability to test it, right? Because that online detector result was, was wrong, right? It was just giving a false result because it didn't know that it, you know, it wasn't able to, 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 to handle the media well. It was compressed media that's very hard to analyze from a detection perspective. And of course, it actually was a forced confession, not a deep fake, right? So um, that made it very hard. So it's it's really this kind of combination of issues that comes together in the Myanmar case. And it also relates to kind of what we might almost call a reverse liars dividend. In this case, it wasn't the state saying that citizen footage was a deep fake, which was a worry we heard pretty much everywhere we did these global convenings was like we already have this problem that you know the Nigerian state says that the footage of the Lekki Tollgate massacre was a fake right this is a classic pattern of the powerful to the weak it's also people who are the weak in this case like the citizens saying wait a second is our government trying to deceive us are they trying to deep fake are the you know the institutional world so it's almost the sort of reverse liars dividend with distrust going both ways that we see in the Myanmar case. Josh? Yeah, I mean, some I think lay, you know laid it out um, really nicely, and I mean it's it's very easy sort of looking at some of these examples and the issues that they bring up, especially with you know questions of the liar's dividend to uh, sort of imagine kind of uh, you know dystopian scenarios in terms of just how it, you know the, the presence of deep fakes could can provide cover for all kinds of actions and you know utterances, um, and I, I suppose for the you know the the, the third example. Um, I mean, just the need to see, you know, labeling as, as an interpretive act, I mean, as something that, that requires nuance, that requires, you know, close reading, close analysis, um, and, you know, needs to be part of the conversation as, you know, people think about frameworks and ways of, you know, putting a lens or, or, or a kind of label on something, um, but the need to, you know, to look very closely at that. Anya and DJ. Yeah, a couple of things, I think the really quick detection of the one politician on from the West is very interesting. Um, and I just, Sam, you've talked about detection equity. And I think that's a huge thing that's super important. Um, who are you prioritizing in terms of who you're going to protect and make sure the truth is known and who doesn't matter because they're not known enough or not enough is, of a, is at stake because they're from a smaller country. Um, so I think that's something. And then also, I think these bring up how sometimes I feel like quality really doesn't even matter because confirmation bias is so strong that if you like, you're not gonna really, really look if you wanna believe that that president is dead. Um, you're not gonna like look for the nuances. You're just gonna be like, it's possible that he is. And I believe that he is because that supports what I already feel. So I think confirmation bias and quality is like a very interesting um, I don't know, tension. 
Yeah, you mentioned, you know, Facebook's resources and where they go into labeling and policing this stuff. And um, that leads us to uh, a conversation around platforms, policy and the law, which is a, a big portion of the of the report. And we're going to only be able to touch on it very briefly here. Um, we're going to close off um, perhaps with statements from all of you. Um, asking you where you feel the responsibility lies. Is it the platforms? Is it um, is it governments? Is it policy? Is it law? Where 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 do we need to begin addressing these 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 very real issues as we've seen today? Um, let's start with you, Josh. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's a huge question. It's an urgent question. I mean I think we can we can move in multiple you know, directions at once. I mean, I think certainly, you know, questions of policy, governments have a huge part to play in this. Um, I mean, they're also holding, you know, platforms responsible. And I mean, as for-profit entities, um, I mean, as far as their motivation, I mean, they, they need to be compelled to act and act in specific ways. And that involves hiring and devoting resources and having people, you know, serve in the role of content moderators. I mean, I also, and this is sort of me wearing my, my um, hat as, you know, a, a liberal arts college professor, you know, I mean, I think there is a, a role for, you know, media literacy and education, say, in the classroom. This is not to say that, you know, it's on the responsibility of, of students or, you know, everyday citizens to, um, to do all the kind of, you know, sleuthing for, for, for deep bakery, but, um, you know, sort of preparing the ground, preparing the culture for, um, you know, for that can participated as members of a discerning public, I think you know, has definitely a, a, a role to play um, as interpreters and close readers of images and understanding these images within a broader context, I think is is crucial. So entering through the classroom. Yeah, entering and leaving. It can be and the, it's a, all the, the rotating all the door. <laughs> <laughs> Anya and, and DJ. Well, I would say from an artist's perspective, it is crucial to be critical of the te technologies that you're using in your art form. And so for us, if we're going to be using a technology, it's important we're not just doing it to uh, create a novelty or you know uh, leverage the no novelty or it's simply a tech demo, but we've actually um, researched the history of how, you know, how is this technology, why was it invented, how has it been used in the past, and how are we using it, you know, within that context. Um, so from an artist perspective, I think uh, there is a responsibility there. Yeah, and I also think that technology, as it always does, usually just kind of augments already existing issues. So I, I love like Nina Jankowitz, who we spoke with about soft evidence and her upcoming book, How to Be a Woman Online, and just kind of seeing these tools as you already have violence against women as a huge issue. And these tools just become kind of a new, new way for these already existing issues to manifest. So I think what they represent also, what the technology enables is kind of also just um, an amplifier of society's issues that needs to be dealing with outside of the technology. So maybe those as well. And for structural approach, Sam. Yeah, you know, and I think we've touched on a few things that we need from the technology side, right? So we need to have detection tools, but we need to have them with equity and access for the populations globally that need the most. And we need agreement on these norms from um, platform developers and app developers about labeling, disclosure, consent. Uh, it gets tough when we get to the platform and government side because governments have already been using the word deepfake to mean lots of things in terms of repressive legislation globally. So I think if we want governments to do it, we should uh, be following international human rights principles. And we have uh, Professor Evelyn Aswad uh, talks in the report about how to use this framework. And of course, one of the key starting points there is just because something makes fun of someone who's powerful, like the head of state, that doesn't justify banning it, right? Which is, uh, you know, a strong tradition about how people have thought about satire and authoritarian and repressive contexts is ban it. So I do think we need to think about how governments handle this in a proportionate way that doesn't overblow the threat of deep fakes to use it against speech. Uh, platforms is going to be really tough, as we've learned. Uh, for the most of the public in the Facebook papers, but as you know, human rights advocate has been saying for years, you know, Facebook and other platforms underinvest massively in content moderation and support globally. Um, we've got to challenge that model. We've got to push back on that. They themselves, and we mentioned in the report, they they had a, an analysis they did on satire and what was needed to assess it. And they talked about you need to know context. It's highly subjective. You need to understand intent. And now if you match that with what we know about the resourcing of content moderation, 
we see the mismatch, right? And so um, I think we need to make demands of the platforms, but we also need to do it next to what governments do and alongside some of the issues that, um, that Josh is particularly raising around media literacy and how we actually support a broader understanding of, of these so that we can have the creative potential of deep fakes um, and not lose that and the satirical potential, not lose that with, with overbroad um, platform control or overbroad government regulation. And in terms of government government regulations, I mean, there's so many issues at national levels. Um, what is your hope for an international approach to this, Sam? Yeah, I, I don't think there'll be an international um, um, sort of legal framework for this other than human rights. And in human rights, we basically, you know, we think about freedom of expression. We say governments should do something that is legitimate, um, legal, necessary and proportionate. So you can't do a blanket ban on fakes. You can't do a blanket ban on particular forms. You need to think in a very targeted way, how is someone creating harm? How is it attacking other people's rights? And I think what we want is then every government to come up with legislation that, that in fact is within those frameworks and that then regulates platforms appropriately within that. That's tough. Um, and I actually think we need to be careful about doing too much that's deep fake specific, right? You know, like it's, you know, this is a sort of, as we've sort of been talking about, it's a symptom and it's a, it's related to all these other issues in the information ecosystem. And so far we've seen the word deep fake weaponized too much for malicious purposes, both the liars dividend at a specific level, but also at the government level, you see deep fakes appearing in legislation in China, the Philippines as part of a justification for repression. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask um, fellows from the lab, our panelists to join us and we're gonna have uh, open it up for a group discussion. Uh, so please turn on your cameras and for you out there uh, in the webinar space, uh, please do uh, drop questions or comments into the Q&A and we'll be, we'll try and get to as many of them as we can. Um, if you, if you, there, there's Artemis and I'm seeing other folks joining as well. Um, is there some, oh, William, I see your hand. Well, first of all, thank you for a wonderful panel and raising myriad questions. I managed to get a peek at the report. It's brilliant. And um, it, I mean, it's, and it's important. It's vitally important. And I guess just hearing this discussion today, and I'm sort of stepping out of the report, um, what it really brought to mind to me were a lot of the debates kind of in the late 19th century about the epistemological status of the photograph, uh, the photos of fair. In science, it's a huge problem, in fact, that the eye is uh, deemed a more accurate uh, uh, assessor of the world than what we would today see as photographic evidence. So let's, but but where it plays out interestingly is like with uh, fairies and with ectoplasm, which are maybe closer to the satire side of this, where it's always a bit tongue in cheek and like, is it real, is it not real? Um, one point. Second point, jump to the emergence of the digital, digital photography. And a lot of the naysayers were already warning us that something like deep fake would be upon us. They didn't have that language, but it was, you can't trust anything. It's all gonna be synthetic. Where do we go? So from what you've talked about today, the liar's dividend comes out loud and clear as one kind of response. Do, do we have a new relationship to the image? And the liar's dividend, grosso modo, don't trust anything, You know, don't believe what you see, could be one response. Um, the, the Ali Bogo, uh, Bongo example was another kind of response, the kind of forensic gaze. We will learn how to assess images. We'll know what to look for. Um, to me, maybe a third way to go didn't come up on what you said, but if I think of the role of illustration in the 19th century newspaper, where it was an, usually an etching, not a photograph, usually exaggerated, not real, people took these images to be representations of the world, but not necessarily 100% accurate. They said something about the world without making a truth claim. There was a kind of funny halfway engagement with the, with the world through those images. And I guess my question to you is, do you see that or do you see other ways as, as possibly defining our, a new relationship with imagery that are, that's gonna be provoked by deep fake? Any of you, sorry, I should have directed Anyone wanna it. take that? I can, I'll, I'll give a perspective on it, which is just from, um, you know, like and one of the things we heard most clearly, and we did this series of, of, of global meetings asking people who were using video and images for pro-social purposes like human rights, and they indicated like, you know, we definitely see this as a threat to the, you know, the evidentiary value, the epistemic value of this. And they said, how do we defend that um, as a, so, so I come from a position of defending 
this sort of the idea of the use of the image, not uncritically, but as a critical tool within evidence within social justice. And I think that leads me more towards like, actually, you need, we're going to need to live with a with probably each of those different models you're describing, William, which is like, and we're going to need to help think how the people who need the different models in their operating sort of system of how they do their work, right? So for human rights and evidence, we're going to need to get much more sophisticated on the media forensic side. We're going to need to understand it much more closely. And we're probably going to see, you know, like the deep fake satire, like for example, Bruno Sartori's work is so clearly in that kind of exaggerated space. Um, I think there's actually an opportunity for it, just actually seeing this as an opportunity to grow media literacy rather than an opportunity to, to, to throw everything out, throw the baby out with the bathwater and what we've seen with the power of, of images and video. Josh. Yeah, I'm willing. Thank you. And I mean, it's. Um, I mean, we could. I think probably spend the rest of our, you know our, our our discussion just sort of you know un unpacking a lot of a lot of those things. I mean, just very quickly on on the maybe some of the historical points. I mean, I think a lot of the the debate or certainly the, the kind of um, you know sort of fears surrounding deep fakery. You know, we could certainly trace back. You know, yeah, I mean, the late 19th century and these sort of waves of emergence of new platforms or new technologies and calls for you know dystopia or utopia, utopia to, to at times I mean coexist and and um, you know when you have the emergence of of, of new technologies, I, I mean I think one of the things that that we were were wrestling with or you know certainly reflecting on extensively with this with this report is, I mean it's 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 both uh, you know trying to look closely at, at Questions of deep fakery and synthetic media, but also to sort of see these forms, you know, so intimately connected with a, an institutional landscape that is so quickly changing, and a kind of broader media landscape that's so unstable. And that's, I think, maybe lends itself to these questions of, of urgency, you know, because you know what's at stake is, you know, yes, I'd say to some degree it's it's a kind of um, sort of shift in, in a relationship to the image, but also, I mean, institutions of image generation and you know, institutions that lend authority and, and credence, and, you know, to, to things like images, but also elections and civil society more broadly. And I know, you know, as I'm talking, the, the stakes are becoming, you know, larger and larger and higher and higher. But I mean, I'd say that, you know, that's one of the things that I think is, is at stake with, you know, how we've been thinking about, you know, deep bakery in action is, you know, how it's connected to so many other aspects um, of how, you know, civil society functions and, um, you know, what can be lost and, and, and gained, you know, in, in this particular moment. And um, yeah, I'd say that th those kinds of things lend a, a degree of particularity to, to this moment. And maybe just to, to, to add, I mean, what strikes me is that the, um, the cure for a lot of the fairies and ectoplasm, in a way the cure, but uh, it was the Kodak, you know, it was the fact that suddenly this thing was in everyone's hands. And once once photography became a mass practice, there was a, I think people actually did approach this stuff with a slightly different gaze. Um, and maybe it's the, the, the availability of the kind of low hanging fruit tools for deep fake that are, you know, that are abundant on the internet that might help people kind of start to develop a, a slightly different perspective. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Anya and Dietje, do you have anything to, to add to this relationship, changing relationship to the image? Sure. I, I think my perspective would be more on our relationship with digital infrastructures as they exist today, um, meaning that most of the infrastructures that we are interacting with are built in a way uh, where they're addictive, they're built in a way that they're meant to be extractive. So already our relationship uh, for consuming media, whether it be visual or, or not, um, it's already precarious. And so I think actually our relationship from a like foundational uh, perspective with technology would have to be repaired and recourse and rebuilt in order to begin to um, you know start tackling the our relationship to the image because I think the two are just unlinkable. You mean because of like the speed? The speed and also you know the the type of um, inflammatory image imagery that is shared um, is is meant uh, to increase engagement. It's the best thing for the platform. Exactly. Like the worst content is the best thing for the platform. Exactly. In most cases. So. Yeah. So that's driving all of the priority on you know if we're underfunding um, detection tools uh, and regulation within, for instance, Facebook. You know, it, it wouldn't be uh, in their interest um, from a profit standpoint and a power standpoint. Artemis. 
Yeah, well, thank you, Kat, and everyone for this timely and important panel. And um, and I do wonder if some of these issues do arise kind of perennially in moments of pronounced, you know, uh, change, technological and cultural. But I have a kind of a different uh, question, which has to do with history and historical events. So I'm thinking about something like... Um, you know, uh, Washington's surprise attack when he crosses the Delaware, and then it's kind of formed into a, um, you know, a tableau painting that kind of really glorifies and elevates, you know, the event has kind of reflects a kind of bias or, or maybe it's satired like the recent cover of the New Yorker magazine was called Crossing the Divide. And, um, or there are always historical reenactors who get dressed up in costumes and actually get on the boat and cross the Delaware. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, when you put these kinds of impulses, um, you know, uh, 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 next to deep fakery and technology, whether or not there are people who are trying to reanimate um, and revise history itself, and whether or not that's a kind of a concern. I mean, um, whether it reflects a kind of a, you know, just there's always going to be an interpretation, but what kinds of biases can be reflected and, and even denials of events themselves in the, uh, in the case of Holocaust denial and whether or not anybody has kind of um, broached those questions. In our research for soft evidence, one of the most interesting things was looking at photo manipulation under Stalin and how he was already rewriting history by, for example, there's a photo of him and say five other politicians, but one of them fell out of his favor. And so they, he had them recreate the image, just subtracting that person um, to make it look like he was never affiliated because they must have done something that pissed him off. So I think it's also interesting to just think about how the intent to rewrite history through photo and video manipulation is not new. It's just now um, so much easier and so much more advanced, but it's it's something that has already been happening. It just takes a little less effort and not a huge photo manipulation team like Stalin had. Right, yeah. um, but um, also just the kind of the way it is the attempts to revise our present understanding of our even our present and how we got here. I mean, just in, in the report, at least, I mean, and we were, you know, looking at a, a wide variety of examples. I mean, Artemis, you know, part of what you're describing, I mean, potentially it's, I mean, it's a pretty big sort of technological lift and a pretty big endeavor. I mean, we haven't seen as many of, you know, sort of grand, um, you know, reimaginings of the past, you know, through synthetic media. I, I mean, and I know there's other people, you know, in, in this Zoom room right now that, you know, that might have particular examples, but I'd say, you know, one of the reasons that at least I didn't find as much of that happening is, you know, the, the power of, of just denial, of just the assertion that something did not happen has been pretty effective. I mean, just in terms of how that has been sort of taken up. I mean, I live in you know, the state, of, the state of Arkansas, which has struggled with, you know, Holocaust education, you know, historically and, and things like that. And, and just the power of, of the denial, the, the power of people asserting that something didn't happen in much more sort of low tech, you know, ways um, has has had, you know, some some resonance. I mean, one of the things that we have seen, though, just to, 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 to wrap it up, um, sort of imaginings of the future, you know, in, in really interesting ways. And that is something I think within a lot of these sort of more pro-social or you know, civic minded uses of, some, of uh, synthetic media, people sort of imagining speeches given in the future, events happening in the future, um, to sort of be these kind of exercises of, of um, you know, progressive imagining. And, I, you know, we have seen a lot of that. Sam? Uh, I don't, don't have anything to add there. Let's, uh, let's go to another question. Sure, I'm just gonna uh, throw to an anonymous attendee uh, in the Q&A um, who points out an important uh, aspect that we, we didn't touch on in the panel. Um, how do you see the role of journalists and fact checkers in all of this? So what about the infrastructures and the institutions of journalism in all of this? Sam? Sure, I, I, I can answer that or take an answer because it's been a, a big focus for us in the last three years as, as we brought together people around this. We brought together social, social media activists, social movement, human rights defenders, but we also brought journalists and fact checkers in the room. Um, and I, I, th I think it's complicated. I think there's a lot of um, focus on how do we skill up journalists and fact checkers, and that's really important to do that, right? There was this very obvious gap in the Myanmar case that, you know, 
journalists didn't have the skills, they didn't have the access to the detection tools, uh, or, to, or to make a good judgment on those tools and whether they worked in order to be effective. And so we've been arguing for, you know, increasing the skills base of journalists in media forensics a little bit to William's earlier point, but also thinking about what are ways to escalate things, because honestly, there's going to be a capacity and skills gap when it comes to good deep fakes. Um, I also think though we've got to avoid that becoming um, the place where we turn to for every claim of deep fakery. It's much harder to prove something's real than it is to claim something's been faked. Um, and so, you know, journalists and fact checkers pointed out that they already felt overburdened, you know, they didn't have the capacity to deal with this. You know, one response within the witness context has been really trying to think, how do you engage community leaders to help understand how they can challenge, you know, deep fakes and shallow fakes with, with more broad media literacy type approaches. And I think we're going to have to have that um, if we expect it. So journalists and fact checkers do need the skills, they do need access to the tools, they do need ways to escalate, but they're already frankly overburdened. Um, so that can't be the only place we put it um, if we're going to look for an emphasis here. Uh, and then we need to build the tools that actually work for them. One of the sort of things that happened early on when we did this process was bringing together technologists working on deepfakes with journalists. And they were working on two different problems, which is a classic kind of like problem that, you know, Kat and I identified when we came into this collaboration together, which was like, you know, other technologists talking to the artists and the, the satirists who are actually coming up with creative ways to use this in the same way the technologists were coming up with solutions to problems the journalists didn't have, right? And so I think we actually have to think about that as we look at it and that, that might actually help us um, move forward. And one area that we certainly talk a lot about in our lab is um, the gaps in tech journalism, how it has historically upheld uh, the technology companies and uh, the, the, the room for critique is, is quite narrow. What about arts journalism, Anya and, and Deja? How, what, what are you encountering as, as you're, you're diving into this tech? It, well, I was going to say, could you clarify a little bit more? Uh, what well, just like in terms of art journalism and art criticism and, and uh, that space in terms of understanding these technologies and, and, and uh, being able to understand the nuance, the range. Yeah, I mean, I think this comes back to a bit what I said earlier about artists having um, this role where and a responsibility to be critical about the technologies that you're that they are using. And I think if you know if if you're being interviewed about a piece uh, and you're using you know facial recognition um, and you're kind of disclosing you know how you did it or at least you know the history of that technology, I think. Uh, in doing that itself, um, you are bringing light to um, some problematic technologies, um, but also providing solutions at the same time and creating a place for discourse and another uh, way to enter into this conversation because someone might be looking at art news, but they might not be looking at Sam Gregory's interview. And I think that is important for artists to bring that up within their practice. It shouldn't be all you know, the, the bur like the burden shouldn't be put on all of journalists as well as all of artists. But I think it's, you know, from our standpoint and our practice important uh, to be critical of the technologies we're using and make sure they, you know, enter in the conversation whenever the work is presented. But Sterling, I more, oh, sorry, go ahead. Just really quick. I do think that digital art and art that's made with technology has um, kind of an issue with, it didn't really get a lot of attention until it started selling for millions. And then the attention that it does get is about prices instead of about content. Yeah. And um, there's huge discussions within the digital art, art and technology sphere about even digital art curation, because it suddenly is, there's not a lot of people, um, there are some, but I think that there's a lot of catching up to do with how to talk about digital art and how to talk about art that's made with technology and ask the questions that you would ask about any other contemporary art. Instead, it's kind of getting fixated on NFT booms and prices and wow technology and not into um, the wider implications and the social structures that birth to technologies and what artists are actually saying about technology through the work that they're making. Thank you. Richard, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. I'm, I'm wondering, looking at the other end of the telescope with the audience, because most Americans in, uh, not most, but a huge amount of Americans rely on fake news in order to make their decisions about their life. 
And the fact that it's pointed out that it's fake news has very little impact. The vaccine, for example, is a great example. A critical race theory is another great example. And so um, I think the question is, who is the, the fake news for? And I think it's kind of preaching to the choir of people who already believe what the source of the news is, that they accept it as the, the source of it. And a lot of the kind of public speaking is not really for necessarily for their own people, but for the world to justify particular oppressive actions. I think of Myanmar, for example, is that I think it's not so much for local audiences as it is for the world audiences to justify and say, look, he confessed. Something Stalin did all the time in, uh, doing that. So anyhow, my point was that looking at the audience end of the, the question of the recipients of fake news. Josh, seems like a question for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think Richard, I mean, you bring up some good points just about, I mean, how people on the ground are, you know, engaging with this kind of media. I mean, I, I would, I mean, I would push back a little bit in, in that, um, I mean, I'm not sure that the sort of current state of things, I mean, you described a little bit about what's happening in the US and I think it resonates with, with what's happening elsewhere. I mean, I don't think that is necessarily beyond repair. I mean, if anything, I think it's, you know, a call to, you know, to be to be more urgent. And I know that, you know, the WHO has a whole kind of you know, guide on misinformation and, and it's been, I think a kind of call for people to work, you know, collaboratively in the public health community with educators, with community leaders. I mean, to, to, to think about how to kind of reframe people's relationship to things like news and popular media and, and, and those kinds of things. So, I mean, I, I, I think that there is, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of sort of crises happening, you know, right now. And, and there is a lot of sort of preaching to the choir um, that happens with people's consumption of fake news. But um, I mean, I see, you know, every day in the, in the classroom that I think you know, the, the, the frameworks can be shifted. And, and I think, you know, both the kind of, you know, granular level of, of analysis by way of, you know, these kinds of reflective conversations, but also the kind of big picture things that have been mentioned throughout the session in terms of policy and the role of governments and, you know, human rights activists, um, you know, also have a, have, have a role to play. So, I mean, if this sounds maybe a bit overly optimistic, um, yeah, that's just, you know, kind of, um, yeah. Uh, as, as a state of mind, I'm, 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 I'm choosing to embrace at this moment. But I mean, certainly, I think you articulate many of the, the key problems we face. Yeah, very quick uh, answer. When I, I remember in the 60s, Walter Cronkite was the most trusted man in America. In 1968, when he went to Vietnam and said, America can't win, Lyndon Johnson said, that's it. You know, I've got no support for the war because he was trusted. Who can you say that of today? I'm going to leave that as a rhetorical question and right. go to Ellen. That's it. That's what it, was <laughs> it was intended as a rhetorical question. <laughs> Ellen, with your okay. eyeball behind you. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted, um, thank you for the presentation. And I just wanted to um, drill down a little bit on Anya and Deja's piece because it brought up a lot of questions as opposed to the more accessible pieces. The first, the, there's two aspects I really wanted to look at, and I found it very compelling because I understand the use of creating your own data and your own data banks. So um, that was something that the other ones haven't really done. The other pieces shown that you started from scratch and creating your own data banks. The second thing I wanted to address was um, the sophistication, but also the delineation between video effects and deep fakes, because what you've essentially done is set up your own studio with your own video, high level video effects, which, um, you know, you could say Pixar also does or other types of studios with deep pockets. So. I would really like you to talk both about uh, the creation of your own data sets, which I found very compelling, um, and also the creation of the effects table, so to speak, or the effects uh, swapping, which um, morphs into deep fakes, but also morphs into just studio effects. So, you know, I want you to delineate that and, and in the context of data. Sure. Uh, so for, I'll, I'll kind of tackle both at the same time to start, which is um, 
we did do the facial capture, you know, we did a longer form facial capture where it was a clean, even lighting. Um, this is really important to us as we are trying to achieve the highest level uh, of a deep fake um, that is possible or face swap that is possible. Uh, but in, additionally, we use an array of other footage as well. All of our um, scenes were shot in a non-studio context. These were places um, that we scouted that were the, uh, a laundromat uh, walking down the street in Mexico City that we had passed by a million times and said, hey, let's transform that. And of course, we uh, adjusted the composition, we adjusted the lighting and these elements. Uh, so there was a craft in that composition. Um, but the actual process uh, is uh, more or less the same in terms of uh, taking a data set, which is uh, the more images that you have and depending on how you label and input them uh, will affect the quality of the of the deep fake and so we have our input source and then we have our destination footage uh, which the face is then you know swapped uh, onto and so the process of using convolutional neural networks is um, a face swapping technique that whether it's a low low fi version or more automatic pipeline i mean there's many ways to do it and ours was very specific um, but this process um, was a machine learning process and a deep learning process so um, did you want to add anything and also feel free to jump in and clarify if there's a particular area you want us to focus on yeah just in terms of the studio question um, our work has takes a lot of forms but film and cinema is one of the forms and I think that was very handy because we it's not the first time we directed something together so it was kind of like directing a film essentially all the same things that went into directing a film except we had this also specific shoot of just the data capture with the lighting all the expressions all the angles of the face and then this added machine learning model swap pretty just like kind of very extreme VFX phase after the directing of a film that's kind of how we approached it. Um, I just want to add one very quick thing, which is what you're doing can now be rendered into a 3D model in VR or AR. Basically, you could take it, I'm not saying you should or you will, but it could be taken very soon a step forward into where the deep fake renders inside an augmented 3D world. I just wanted to add that. Yeah, thanks, Ellen. Absolutely. That was what I was, what I was going to point to is this notion of virtual production and mm -hmm. um, these real time stages where uh, the, VF, the VFX are actually front ended in, in the production process. And that has huge implications for documentary as we're, we're exploring at the lab. Um, one final question, I'm going to I'm going to take it from Sterling Warren uh, from the Q&A. What is the role of documentary filmmaking in the current media landscape when seeing is not quite believing? Remember that phrase, Sam? Will this lead more to cinematic digital abstraction, another stylistic paradigm? Sam, I'm going to start with you. Yikes. Um, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll talk about it from a witness perspective, it's like, it's very interesting in kind of how we've been thinking about our work in, in, you know, in the coming years. So we anticipate much more synthetic media. We anticipate much more challenges on truth claims. So for us, it, it, it involves actually looking at a number of different sort of strategies that are in the sort of the documentary space. One is doubling down on how you corroborate videos evidence, right? So not really documentary, but how do you protect the integrity of critical videos? How do you support people to do narrative advocacy in ways that take advantage of new formats, right? Um, so that to really understand how to, you know, convincingly use narrative that in fact might use synthetic techniques, but is towards an advocacy goal. And the third is also to really understand how do we think about the world of open source investigation. And I think of, say, the work of the visual investigations team at the New York Times or Bellingcat or Forensic Architecture as being documentary in nature. And so I think I see a pluralism happening around that is driven by, by these challenges of of what video can and can't do and what images can and can't do. And, and that's how we're approaching it is trying to really lean into that pluralism of forms. Thank you, Josh, role of documentary. Yeah, I mean, just to echo some of what Sam said, I mean, I think there are you know, a couple of applications with, with real urgency you know, for this technology. I mean, documentary, I think has, has always been, I mean, at, at the forefront of um, you know, shifts in, in technology and how you know, people can imagine really the role of, of moving image media in the world as having a kind of social purpose and, and for a social good. 
um, you know, in both the kind of small scale levels of say reporting and, and, and documenting as well as maybe more kind of narrative um, long form films. I mean, I think welcome to Chechnya was, was, was mentioned earlier in the context of this panel, but I, I mean, it's being a really fantastic you know, project that I think, you know, really uh, takes full, you know, account of a lot of these ethical questions that we've raised, but is still very much in the realm of aesthetics and moving image art, you know, and, and documentary really is a form of art and sort of thinking about, um, you know, synthetic media as both, you know, a, a kind of solution maybe to a, a, a certain kind of um, ethical challenge or a certain kind of necessity to protect identity, um, but doing it in a way, in a way that's artful, that's engaging, um, that's sort of pushing, I think, the aesthetic as well as the um, sort of social boundaries of documentary. So I think there already are some projects um, that are, I think, providing some interesting precedents um, and, and it will be exciting to see what happens, um, you know, going forward. Last word to the artists. Role of documentary. I'm excited to be an audience <laughs> to all the documentaries that are made that are ethically using this. I think it's gonna be really exciting. Um, and I also think a little bit going back to Richard's point about the role of art and avoiding the preaching to the choir. And I think, again, we kind of chose to go away from um, any sort of imagery that might be polarizing. I mean, I guess two women erotically naked in a tub might be polarizing to some people, but I'm talking about like really polarizing, um, in, AKA a political figure. And so that was the intention of, I mean, I have a lot of family that voted for Trump and I think about it just needing to be that people can have a conversation and maybe they're just interested in cinema and they like the classic cinema style aesthetic and they're able to discuss and be like, wait, is this real? Is her hand? See, no, if her hand went over here, you wouldn't be able to tell. So like just to have a conversation about the fact that this is possible, the fact that it exists. And I think art is an entry point for people to be able to start having those conversations and not suddenly get distracted and end the conversation because they disagree on something. So I think art and documentary both have a lot of potential and will be enriched by this as long as we can get the ethics and the bumpers up. Thank you so much. Um, there's a lots of comments and questions we didn't get to in the chat, unfortunately. A lot of people asking when this report comes out and we're just gonna say as soon as we possibly can, right, Sam and Josh? <laughs> we're working on it within the next few weeks. Hopefully it will be up. Um, and um, we hope that the report is the beginning of a conversation and we would like it to function as a springboard uh, to more think tank sessions, including people as you've, you've heard from today um, and uh, really address this as a democratic collaborative approach uh, to who decides the questions around, uh, in this case, deep fakes and satire, but obviously so much more. It's all the time we have. I want to thank um, these wonderful panelists that we've had today, Anya, uh, Deja, Josh, and Sam. Um, and uh, I also want to invite you to join us next time.